So I will try to um, say a few things about uh, this type of inequality. So let me start with uh, setting what is a small mole probability that I'm talking about. Let's say that I have a C, no negative random variable. What I would like to 
know it is uh, what is the probability that this random variable will be smaller than uh, the expectation and I want this to be small and I want to quantify this. So <coughs> uh, small ball probabilities tells me that it is uh, more probable that I would be far away from zero and this is quite helpful in some problems. Let me also justify why uh, they are called small ball probabilities. So this is the typical setting that we will work. We will, let's say that x is a random vector in Rn. And let's say that we have some norm. Then uh, I will choose c to be the norm of this random vector. And then I'm asking, what is the probability that uh, the norm of this random vector will be less than the expectation? So uh, if you read what this says, it says, what is the probability that x will fall on some small ball of, uh, of uh, this radius? And I would like to to have estimated that this is small. Okay, so this is very general. Let me uh, 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 talk about a, a problem that uh, this uh, small ball probabilities appear naturally. So uh, let me uh, uh, work, let me uh, tell you about the uh, approximation of a covariance matrix by the sample covariance matrix. So let's say, again, x uh, is a random vector in a RAN. Let's call uh, sigma the covariance matrix. And uh, let's uh, write a sigma bar and uh, the sample covariance matrix. So this is the 1 over n. Uh, it's I, so I take n samples and I would like to find if I have an epsilon positive I want to find n <laughs> such that I will approximate uh, up to an epsilon the covariance okay so that's a, a, a rather classical problem uh, so that's uh, that's, uh, uh, of course, by the law of Nelson numbers, we know that eventually this will be true. And uh, I would like to find the best possible uh, n, so the smallest number of samples that I can approximate the covariance matrix. So let me uh, give you the answer if I start with the uh, Gaussian vector. So x i are independent copies of uh, the random vector. And uh, we would like to have an answer of uh, <coughs> no more than a constant times n of, of this order, n over epsilon square. That's the answer for the Gaussian measure. So um, I can choose my inner product such that uh, the covariance matrix to be uh, the identity. So I will then I would say that x is isotropic. I say that x is isotropic if uh, the covariance matrix is just the identity. And uh, I can, uh, the problem will be the same if, uh, if I will choose this to be the identity. So in that case, uh, my problem becomes the following. I would like to find and so that sum i from 1 to n of uh, each scalar. Can you see here? <coughs> right. uh, then I, will, I would like to write my problem. I change my problem and I want you to find the capital N so that xi theta, uh, let me write it in this way, it squares between 1 minus epsilon and 1 minus epsilon if I'm uh, on, uh, on that case. So uh, I would like to find the answer that this will be true and uh, this problem is not uh, different than the following problem. Uh, let's uh, write the matrix x1, x capital N. So this is the matrix that I <coughs> put all my copies as uh, columns. And I would like to find the smallest and the largest.
are just singular values of, uh, of this matrix, and I would like, uh, with this normalization, to have an estimate of uh, square root of n plus a constant square root of small n, and square root of n minus a small constant square root of small n. And uh, this, in this formulation, this is essentially equivalent to my initial problem if I want to have this answer at the very end. So let me say a few words about the story of this problem. In uh, convexity, this problem has been asked by Karen Lovas and Simonovic. Uh, in the uh, beginning of the 90s, and uh, the random vector x was uh, uniform, uniformly chosen from a convex body k, and uh, their motivation they wanted to uh, they wanted to solve this problem in order to have some fast algorithm to compute the volume of a convex body, and. Uh, they gave some uh, uh, polynomial bounds, not uh, linear with respect to n. And uh, there were a lot of work afterwards. Uh, first, it was uh, Bourguin who uh, improved it to uh, n up to logarithms. And then it was Rudolfson. Then uh, I had some contribution on killing some logarithms. And uh, finally, under this assumption, that was solved by Damczak, Pazur, Tomczak, and Litvak. <coughs> and uh, that, uh, gave that uh, they gave this answer. So they proved that if I will pick uh, each size, uh, independently from some convex body k, then uh, I will need this type of uh, uh, many samples in order to approximate the covariance matrix up to, up to an epsilon. Uh, so the work on the Bourguin and Rudelson that was late 90s, I think that was 99, that was 97, and uh, Danzak Pazor and Tomczak, that was 2009, if I remember correctly, or 8. Uh, then it was realized that uh, this problem is not so much to do about the convexity of K. So uh, later on it was realized that uh, uh, one can do it even with uh, heavy tails. That was joint uh, work with uh, Sahar Mendelssohn. And it was also a uh, work of uh, Versinin and Srivastava with different <coughs> assumptions, but with some mobile assumptions that I will uh, say in a moment. That was around 2013. And uh, right now, uh, there we have a very good picture about uh, what is going on. There is, uh, I think the optimal result is that right now due to Kosta Tikhomirov. And there is also a very nice return result by <coughs> Mendelssohn. And uh, actually, only with uh, minimal moment assumptions, we know that it is true. But actually, right now, it is more or less understood that these are two types of problems. It is the problem of largest singular value. And this is the problem of the smallest <coughs> singular value. And uh, the largest singular value requires some moment assumptions, or on tails. And the smallest singular value requires a small ball probability. So there is a result of Tikhomirov that it is all also about smooth analysis, that uh, only with small ball probabilities one can decide the smallest singular value, even if the largest singular value under this assumption can be infinite. So these are type, two different types of problems. And there are two different types of assumptions <coughs> in our probability that are required in order to figure out what are 
uh, uh, <coughs> how to estimate uh, this, uh, these probabilities. Um, now, uh, actually, very recently, there has been developed a method, I can write it here, by Sakhar uh, Mendelssohn, that is a general method to prove uh, lower bounds for uh, uh, non-negative empirical processes. And uh, essentially what is needed in order to run this method is small ball probabilities. That's why it's now called Mendelssohn's small ball probability estimate, small ball probability method. So uh, if, uh, if I want to figure out how to bound from below a uh, quadratic process, then essentially what I, what I needed only what I've needed is a small ball probability type estimate. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not only in the case of random matrices. There is uh, also a similar situation in random polynomial systems that uh, uh, in order to give a lower bound for the condition number, there is a notion of condition number, then again, uh, what is uh, critical is uh, small ball probability. So this is what is needed in order to uh, find good distance from Milpo's problems. Um, let me, my goal is uh, to, at least this is one setting that small ball probabilities are uh, the crucial uh, tool that you need in order to prove the right bounds. Uh, my goal is to present four different uh, uh, type of uh, small ball probabilities and different methods uh, uh, to, to prove them, so let me stick with uh, on this problem and uh, talk about the first one. Let's say, for simplicity, that uh, x, that is my random vector, it is x1, xn. Now these are, let me write it like that, these are the, the coordinates. And let's assume that the xi's are independent then uh, I would like to know uh, small ball probabilities for now for this random vector and it turns out that uh, uh, the method that I just described requires to know small ball probabilities only for the one dimensional marginals. So what that means, it means that I need to know how this behaves. I still have the isotropicity assumption, so under the isotropicity assumption, the expectation of this guy is one. So I, uh, um, I, I, I isotropicity assumption for me means that I also have centered. So I, uh, the random variables are, are centered, and I have uh, variance one. So uh, what I would like to know it is I would like to know that this is true under the assumption that this is true for all of the coordinates. So my assumption is <coughs> that assume that yes. the expectation of the square is one. Yes, center center means this is zero. No. Uh, and the expectation of the square is one. Covariant covariance identity. Yes, but I write theta is one. I will write it right now. Thank you. So theta is on the sphere. So I have, uh, this is what I would like to know. And uh, uh, let me write down what, that, what is my assumption. I mean that I have an estimate of this type. Uh, this is essentially equivalent as in writing it that uh, this is a density and the density is bounded. And uh, my question is, if this is true and x i are independent, this is, is this, uh, can I have something like that? That's the question. That's a quite simple question. If you ask uh, the other way around, if I know that uh, I have independent random variables and I have some tail estimates uh, about the decay, let's say it's a Gaussian, and I'm asking if this is 
uh, also some Gaussian, this is the one <coughs> sign inequality, this goes back to the beginning for probability. Now, if you ask the same question for the small ball probability, you will assume that this is something quite simple. The answer to this question is yes, but it has been proved just in 2015 by Rudolf Sonnenberg. It looks a little bit surprising, but this is uh, somehow the nature of the small ball probabilities is different. And uh, uh, the best constant, now we know the best constant, I will describe the proof. It is uh, joint work with uh, Galina Lipschitz. Peter <coughs> um, so. so let me uh, explain uh, uh, what is uh, what is the idea of the proof. That's my first uh, small group of ability that I want to discuss. So, what are the ideas of the proof? Um, first of all, the first step in the proof is a symmetrization argument. Sure. Symmetrization argument uh, says that I can go to the decreasing rearrangement and the, uh, the inequality goes on the good direction. So I can uh, symmetrize first and uh, wh whatever is my density, I can make it to be center and uh, uh, decreasing. The second step, let me first say that this symmetrization requires uh, some inequality about rearrangements. Actually, it needs the brass complete Lundiger inequality, that it is uh, a non trivial one. And then, uh, if I will go <coughs> to a symmetric, then uh, there is a second argument that uh, it tells me that among all symmetric and decreasing, the constant is the worst one. And this requires uh, the theorem of Cantor. And uh, there is a third step. What, what is the theorem of Cantor? The theorem of Cantor says. Um, 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 it is ab about unimodal uh, functions. I prefer to, to, to say at the end, is it, okay. if, if, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, for, uh, th there is an argument that says that uh, I can go pointwise to this uh, to, to these guys, and the theorem of Cantor allows me to, to tensorize it. Okay, so this is point-wise, it's a, a trivial one-dimensional inequality, but the question is how you tensorize it. And the theorem of Cantor tells you that if you have unimodal functions, in this way you can, uh, you can tensorize it. Okay. And there, I will give the precise statement at the end, if I have time. So uh, then uh, uh, I, have, I have this inequality, and at the end, what, I, what I've done, I have uh, arrived to to consider the problem when I have uh, IID uh, uniform. Uh, and so that means that I am on the, I have a random vector that I sample from the discrete cube. And I want to find among uh, all these guys what is the, what is the worst case uh, marginal. So when I'm asking about this, then uh, this problem becomes uh, to find uh, what is the infinity norm of all uh, one-dimensional marginals? So let me just draw a picture. This is, I'm really in n dimensions, but I cannot draw this. I need to find the best direction, and then uh, what will be the marginal? Uh, the marginal, the distribution of the marginal will be uh, the volume of all sections. The maximum uh, of uh, the density will be the maximum section. So I need to solve the following problem. Find the maximum volume section of uh, the cube among all uh, directions. And the answer to that, this is a theorem of Keith Bohr, says that uh, the best direction, the worst direction, is uh, the one, is this one. So if you combine all this together, it says that on this problem, the best constant, you found it when you take the convolution of two uniforms. 
okay? But you require to do all, all these steps, and uh, there's some geometry that comes into the game. And this is just the IID case. Okay, so um, now, uh, <coughs> if I don't have IID, then uh, in order to solve this problem, I would like to know small ball probabilities, not about uh, the one-dimensional marginals, but about every uh, k-dimensional marginal. So there is a version of this theorem uh, also about every k-dimensional marginal, and the formulation is the following. If, uh, if I start all true with some constant c, then for every k, and <coughs> every f k dimensional, we have that probability that if I would take the Euclidean norm of the projection to be less than epsilon n square root of k, that's now the expectation uh, of uh, this guy under the isotropicity assumption. This is less than a constant times epsilon to the k. OK. So, and the proof essentially follows the same, same line. It's a little bit more complicated, but uh, the, this, this is how the idea is. OK. So, uh, on this first example of small ball probabilities, just uh, it's someone, the difference between uh, large deviation and small ball probabilities. If uh, on the same problem on small on large deviation, it will be just a ten of pound or a, some Laplace method, and you can get your answer. Uh, what is the second thing about small ball probabilities? It is that uh, they occur much more often than uh, large deviation. So it is much more probable that we will find small ball probabilities. So this is very bad what I'm saying, but I can write down a, a, a theorem that uh, says exactly that. So this is a second example of small ball probabilities. <coughs> uh, let's say that I have uh, uh, x a random vector. Let's say that it, uh, it, is, uh, it, it has some density and assume that the density, this is, this is the density, <coughs> uh, and assume that the infinity norm of the density is bounded. Let's call this alpha. Uh, so you, you have uh, any, uh, uh, any density that it is in, uh, in L infinity, call uh, alpha the, the bound, then <coughs> if you take, take any k between 1 and n and uh, take the probability of uh, the projection k, then uh, you have a bound of uh, constant times epsilon. You have also this alpha here to the power k. So that will be perfect. Not so perfect. I think you have a. a Correction of n plus 1 over n. And uh, this is happening for a random, for a random f with uh, probability more than 1 minus e to minus k times n in the degrees model. So G and K is the Grassmannian. So this, this means that if I will take randomly a subspace with extremely high probability, then uh, this subspace, the marginal on this subspace, will satisfy a small ball probability up to a very small error. So that's, that says that uh, if you just have a density, if you have any random vector in a RAN, small ball probabilities are there. It's very difficult to miss them, actually. OK? Now, there is a cut on this theorem. I'm not assuming that it is isotropic. And uh, without this assumption that it is isotropic, this is sharp. Because I can just uh, take a Gaussian, take it to generate on some k-dimensional and everything else will be the same, then, uh, then uh, this will be the situation that you have. This, you cannot get away from it. 
Now, this, uh, um, what is the proof of this theorem? This, uh, this requires uh, some, uh, let me just say that this is uh, from a joint work with uh, Susanna Dunn, Peter Pivovarov, and myself, uh, 2000, that is 2016. I see, and just, you know what you said, the fact that when you make it degenerate in, in a narrow dimensional subspace, it doesn't blow up A because, because of the one variant partition. So it is a little bit surprising that I cannot blow it up more than that. And uh, there is a good reason for this. There is, uh, the proof goes through some uh, affine invariants on the gross money. So the proof essentially has some representation theory and says that on the gross money there is something that's affine invariant. So you cannot blow it, whatever you will do, whatever affine transformation you, you will apply, this cannot blow up more than that. Okay, so this is the two steps. That the first there is some affine variance, and this builds on some work of uh, Fulzberg. And then uh, you, since you have the affine variance, then you prove you solve some isoparametric problem problem on the graph, <coughs> and then uh, then you, then you have this thing. So this says that small board probabilities are there. It is just uh, very difficult to miss them. So that's my number two. Let me go to my number three. So now uh, let me go back to X uh, <coughs> uh, again uh, uniform <coughs> on some complex body K. And again, I will assume that X is isotropic. <coughs> and uh, now again, you want to solve the small ball probability problem. So this is the theorem. This is uh, uh, 2012. It says that uh, the small ball probability, what we know for this is uh, that this is less than a constant times epsilon square root k. For every k now, for every k and for every uh, k dimensional, uh, this small ball probability is true. Uh, so this is uh, this is what we know. That's uh, the best known result, and uh, there are many. Uh, several uh, attempts to, to prove this uh, theorem. Uh, there is also a different proof by Emmanuel Milman and was Clartak, I think, uh, uh, 14. And there is also a very recent proof by Yen Ted Lee and Sandus Bembala. Uh, in December, uh, that uh, this proof uh, used uh, the stochastic localization of uh, Ronald and Dunn. Uh, and uh, in all of the cases, they estimate that you get a square root of fan, so Sorry, this is not as I'm writing, it is quote of K, not, not N. As I wrote it, so you see that there is a difference with uh, the random one that uh, it, should be, uh, it should be K. And uh, there is a good reason why we have this gap. There is uh, a conjecture that says that uh, the right bound here should be constant to the k. And uh, this conjecture it is just uh, one of the many equivalent formulations of perhaps the most known problem in uh, high dimensional convexity, which is, so this is an equivalent formulation of uh, the hyperplane conjecture. So 
So what the hyperplane conjecture says, it says the following, something seemingly uh, very different. Uh, the hyperplane conjecture was asked uh, in the middle 80s, in 85 by Jean Bougain, and asked the following, if uh, K is a complex body, then uh, uh, there exists always uh, n dimension, n minus one dimension of uh, subspace, fine subspace, such that the, if I would slice it with this uh, subspace, then uh, the volume will be more, let me write this volume as one over k, okay, the maximum of uh, subspaces, uh, that this will be more than a constant. Okay, so it says the following, that if you give me any complex body, that uh, sounds quite simple. If you give me uh, any complex body, then always I will, can find a way to slice it. And when I will slice it and I will measure the slice, then this slice should be, if, if my complex body has volume one, let me forgot my normalization, then uh, there will be always some slice that it will have a large volume. So that's a hyperplane conjecture and uh, has many, many equivalent formulations. One of the equivalent formulations is that the small board probability should be like in the Gaussian, should be, uh, should be K. Not, uh, <coughs> now, what are the best bounds? Zhang Rugen proved uh, at the uh, 80s a bound of uh, fourth root of N log N. And it was Boss Clark that proved it to uh, fourth, fourth root of n. Uh, so this is the best that we know, that uh, there will, there's always a slice that has volume more than constant over fourth root of n. So if the conjecture is wrong, means that there will be a convex body that uh, however you will slice it, you will see no volume when n goes to infinity. And uh, there are uh, other proofs that gives the fourth root of n, the, the work of uh, Yendali and Vipala, they, they wrote two, three papers last year. They also retrieved the best known bound. So let me say a few words about the, um, Just a quick question. The, yeah. uh, what's the quantitative version of the uh, equivalent of hyperplane and uh, right. the exponent? Right, uh, so, okay, the, the equivalence, the one direction is very uh, easy, the other direction requires some work, and when I'm saying equivalent, I mean in the following way, that if for every n and for every k the hyperplane conjecture is true, then for every n and for every, you have this, uh, this estimate of this type, and the quantitative version is that uh, whatever you have here, so, let me write it. Uh, let me write it in this form. <coughs> just per body. It's, it has to be. It's not an equivalent. Per no. Body. No, no. It's not. It is. Uh, if if I know that this is the answer for all, uh, then I know the hyperplane. Uh, and uh, the formulation is the following. So it's enough to know that. So if I know n over a, then uh, I get uh, that the soup over all n, l of uh, k, uh, it will be less than uh, a up to some loads. So essentially, if you if you improve the square root of n to anything better, then uh, then you improve the context. And, and it's already on the level of. I see. Uh, up to, up to a log, it is uh, the, the reason that we are stuck on square root of n. It is because the hyperplane conjecture is stuck on the fourth up to log. And uh, and the statement is true for.
for any law complaint, it doesn't have to be in the street, uh, the, the small boat estimate. It doesn't have to be uniform in conduct body. It's also true for law complaint. Uh, yes. Yes, so, uh, yes, so, so since you mentioned it, um, uh, all, all, the, all this theory can be extended <coughs> to uh, the set of uh, measures that are low concave. So uh, what is a low concave measure? It's a measure that has density e to minus v of x, the x where v is a function from a right to a bar in my uh, infinite value from it. So this is uh, uh, the type of local cave me uh, measures and uh, all, uh, all, all the story that I write in here, you can extend it in the right way to the set of uh, local cave measures. Right. Um, maybe, maybe I would skip, uh, maybe I would say just uh, two words about uh, the proof of this. Um, so again, the convexity comes uh, into the game. Um, the, the proof of this, it is uh, a projection type uh, method and uh, projection induction. Um, I have to say that uh, also the other, the last division inequality is also true and it's of the same order. The conjecture here says that we expect that the small ball should be better than uh, the large uh, deviation. Let me move to um, my fourth one. Any questions? So let me talk about the dual problem. On uh, number three, we had the uh, some uh, x that was uh, random, yeah, uniformly picked from a convex body k. That is a very uh, general assumption. It is a very rough object, difficult to understand. But uh, the, the function, the norm that we had was just a Euclidean norm. Now, uh, let's uh, change the picture. And let's say that uh, I will work with a Gaussian measure that I know very well and I will have just uh, any, any norm. So that's my norm four. So now I would like to understand what is the probability. I have some norm. I have a Z a standard Gaussian. And I would like to understand this object. So uh, Z is uh, normal standard normal uh, Gaussian vector. Now, on uh, this one, on the Gaussian measure, we know much, much more. So first of all, we know the solution of the isoparametric problem. This is due to Borel and also to Sudak uh, and Tillerson. And uh, this says that uh, if I have any function, f, that it is ellipsis, if f is a ellipsis function, <coughs> with a constant l, then uh, the probability that f would be more than uh, one plus epsilon times the expectation. Uh, let me write just for positive functions, since uh, at the end I want to talk, uh, I want to talk only about norms. <coughs> so I will write in this formulation the probability that f will be more than one plus epsilon. The probability that f will be less than one minus epsilon. <coughs> Both uh, these uh, probabilities are less than the expectation of e the t squared over 2 times t squared. Sorry, I have to put the expectation here, so I should put So that's the concentration of measure. It says that if I have a ellipsis constant, then it's concentrated around, around its mean or around its expectation. And uh, this is uh, uh, one formulation. 
Uh, I said that this is the solution of the isoparametric problem, which says that uh, among all sets in the ghost space, uh, the, the one that has the smallest uh, 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 epsilon exp uh, extension are uh, the, the half spaces. So the functional formulation is this one. Uh, so this already gives some uh, estimate about uh, the small ball probability, but uh, you expect, because it is a norm, that it will be uh, more skewed to the left, so you expect that the small ball probability will be better than the large deviation one, and uh, actually this is the case. So... In the case that one has a complex function, then uh, one can improve this inequality, the one side of uh, this inequality. So again, the convexity comes into the game to and improves things. So this is theorem. <coughs> this is a uh, joint work with uh, Pedro Valletas, uh, 17 and says the following, if f is convex, and it's not important if it is lipsis or not, then one has the following improvement. I will compute, okay, let me keep positive since uh, I'm gonna talk about at the end uh, about norms. I compute the small deviation inequality, and uh, the small deviation inequality, I can improve it to p squared expectation of f squared. And here I have a, I have a constant, universal constant. T is epsilon on the right. Thank you. And uh, with the improvement, instead of the Lipschitz constant, I have the variance of f. And uh, why this is an improvement, we have that the variance but <coughs> it's always less than the expectation of the infinity norm of the graph. This is just Poincaré inequality for the low space. And this is always less than the Lipschitz constant to the square if it is Lipschitz. So what it means, it means that uh, we, have, uh, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have improved it to if, if uh, we are on the uh, one side. So this looks a little bit strange because uh, uh, why, why you can improve the isoparametric problem, you don't improve the isoparametric problem. The reason that this holds true, it is uh, because uh, the Gaussian measure has also some uh, convexity property. And uh, the, the reason for that, so the proof, <coughs> depends on uh, errant inequality. Not about, not uh, on the isoparametric problem. And the Erhard's inequality says the following, that uh, um, it's an improvement on the log concavity of the Gauss measure. And says that uh, if I have uh, A and B two uh, moral sets, then uh, if I would take this one, This is Erhard's inequality, and where phi is uh, the distribution function of uh, the one dimensional Gaussian. Okay, so this is what Erhard's inequality says, and uh, this is something different than uh, the isoparametric problem, and uh, this works well with convexity, so this is the reason behind uh, this improvement. So, for example, now we can. Uh, try to apply it in some special cases. Then we generalize to uniformly convex or compared or it has to be Gaussian. It has to be Gaussian. This is a very, very, very Gaussian inequality. Uh, for example, I know how to extend <coughs> uh, this result uh, to log concave measures, but with the price that they will not be squares. 
it will be square root of the variance and thus the epsilon expectation is square root of the variance. But if you want to go to the squares, I know that it's true only for the Gaussian. And even for the uniform measure on the unit ball, for the Euclidean ball, which is very, very close to the Gaussian, is wrong. It, it, it's not that I don't know, it's wrong. So this is very Gaussian. And Erhard's inequality is known that it is really Gaussian inequality. It's not, it's not true for almost anything. <coughs> so this is, this is a... An improvement, this is on the small deviation regime, so the next step is to try to do it uh, on uh, the level of small ball probabilities. So let's see an example. Um, uh, let's consider the f to be f of uh, x to be the maximum, so the infinity norm. Then uh, 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 what we have, we have that the ellipsis constant is uh, 1. But uh, we have that uh, the variance of uh, this norm is 1 over log n. Uh, so uh, you improve it by a logarithmic term on the exponent. But this is still far away from uh, the small ball probability. The small ball probability for this function with respect to the Gaussian measure is the following. The probability that f of x less than epsilon times the expectation of f is less than uh, e minus n to <coughs> 1 minus constant times epsilon squared. So this is how it looks like. And uh, it looks almost impossible to find some inequality that it will give that. However, um, this is a uh, Joint work, I think I would say that and I would stop. This is uh, a joint work with uh, Kostner Tikhomirov. And uh, Petrus Valetas, 18. Uh, we can prove that uh, we can always find, we can always fix, <coughs> uh, let's say that f is a norm. We can always uh, fix our inner product. So uh, always I have to, in order, in order to have a good inequality, I have to fix the, my norm and the, the covariance of the Gaussian to be comparable. So I, ca I can always uh, find, we can find uh, a covariance for the Gaussian. Such that uh, the small ball probability for the norm will be at least as good <coughs> as uh, for the cube. And uh, the only problem that we have, well, it is that we require f to be one unconditional for that. And uh, if we drop the one conditionality assumption, then uh, we can prove an estimate of uh, n to some power gamma or for when epsilon is fixed, which is uh, very, very different than the large deviations in equality. For example, for the infinity norm, the large deviations is like e minus epsilon square log n. But you can improve the small ball probability to a polynomial. Uh, well, again, this is typical of the case. You expect that the small ball probabilities will be better. However, the proof, it is very, very, very different than uh, the usual approach uh, due to isoperimetry, to log Sobolev, uh, or uh, to uh, uh, IED pounds. The proof of this result use uh, the uh, small deviation inequality that I mentioned there. And then uh, we uh, smoothen our function along to the Osai-Nulovic systemic group. And we stop on a time that uh, we optimize all parameters. And then we choose uh, uh, our, our covariance appropriately with respect to uh, uh, all these tools. So I. What does it mean you should? I don't get. Okay, so I mean that I can always 
I need to find some linear transformation. If you give me a norm, I can always have the generate it and make it look like a slab, and then the best that I can hope it accepts it. Okay, so if I, if I have a norm and I have the, Gauss, I have the Gaussian, I have the, the covariance of the Gaussian and the norm to be comparable in order to optimize the small bond that I can get. If, if not, I can just, uh, the, the same goes also in the previous example, I had some isotropicity. So maybe what's in the picture, so you have the, the ball of the norm and then you have the, the, you know, the ball of, of the covariance? And what, what I, I, will, I will find some linear transformation in order to make them comparable, that's what I mean. By like comparable, you mean like a joint position? Or it is not a joint position. Okay. It is some, position some, some position, but it is not a joint position. Uh, I can describe it in this case, it is analytic, and in that case, uh, it comes through many theorems. So, um, um, it uses some topological tools in order to, Borsuk Ulam, in order to find some position. And then there is uh, the Alon Milman that uh, finds the structure. I, ca I, can, I can tell you the details after about what, uh, how, how you find it. But when I mean I find the structure, I mean that there exists a linear map. Or else, uh, uh, I cannot say anything, but I will put the linear map here. OK, that's, that's the same. W without a linear map, I cannot hope for anything else than epsilon. Because I, I can always make it like a, look like a slot. Okay, I guess uh, I will stop here and be happy to. <laughs> Thank you. What's the conjecture here for general converse functions? Okay, um, so the. The conjecture is that the worst case scenario is always the cube. That's always easy to say. In <coughs> of that. It's always the cube. Now, um, Boas Klartak asked if that was possible, if it, if it always can be possible to be uh, polynomial. So this is already a, a big difference with the large deviation. And the large deviation, I can only hope for logarithm for the infinite norm. But uh, if I have a, a norm, I can always have from inside a polynomial concentration on the exponent. And uh, perhaps the worst case scenario is the cube that it is uh, very, very, uh, it's not only polynomial, but it's uh, exactly Okay, there's no more questions, that's time to